shooting. We're shooting. The microphone is going to be here. So, okay. But I'd like everybody to, yeah, be behind. You know what I mean? And maybe in the shade a little would help too for you guys. No, you're fine. No, you, no, no, you're fine. Yeah, that's good. That's better. Ten steps up even would be fine. Five yeah, steps up. Five yeah, we can get in the shade. Outside of room two. Two one six is a heart. Okay. So, okay. And the Blumenthal, Blumenthal staff said that was okay. Okay. So um, we're not going to come back here. Chris, why don't you move a little bit more? It's in the sun. I got burned. Oh, do you want to switch so you can oh, do it? Oh, sure. You're good. Right down there. Yep. 
My name is Nadia Milleron, N-A-D-I-A-M-I-L-L-E-R-O-N. And my daughter is Samia Stumo. She died on the Boeing plane ET-302, March 10th, 2019. Okay. Hey, just stand by for a minute. I'll just tell the other people that are going to be here for spelling sake. Um, we have the Moore family. So we have Clarice Moore, C L. A R I S S M O O R E and David Moore and their dad Chris Moore and then we also have Adnan Stumo my son and Samia's brother A D N A A N spelled last name S T U M O and then we also have Catherine Berthet and she'll spell her name when she gets up here for you. And Zipporah Kuria, she'll also spell her name when she comes up. So I am here today because David Calhoun, that people, the, the, the dings that you hear are people coming on Zoom. Okay. Okay. So, Do you want to mute that? I can mute all that for now. Would, is somebody, okay. nobody yeah, has arms them, right? for this. I, I have an extra hand. All right. Maybe you can put it by your legs so people can see the. Sure. And then everybody, we're the ones who step up to say whatever it is. We obviously have a little bit of a time deadline because we have to make some of this here. I've been told the uh, families have row three. Row three. Right. In the uh, room 216. 216. Okay. Yeah, we'll walk over Oh, sure. And back for the... Okay. My name is Nadia Milleron. I lost, we lost our daughter Samia Stumo in the Boeing crash in March 10th, 2019. And the reason that we are still coming out to protest and speak up is because Boeing has not improved its safety. Even since five years ago, even six and seven years ago, they knew about a lot of problems with manufacturing and they didn't improve it. So you can see that this is real. David Calhoun is testifying before the Senate today. We expect him to say all about the improvements that they have made. The problem is that he is lobbying to reduce the, <clears throat> through the um, funding of the FAA, the FAA Reauthorization Act. David Calhoun and his lobbyists are lobbying to weaken oversight and weaken the controls over safety. They are pushing for that right now in the process of lobbying Congress. And then he's gonna tell you today that he is pushing for safety. But the problem is also that every single element, every single rubric that he has in place to push for safety, he had in place five years ago. It's just that they don't follow it. So when they get pressed for time and they need to produce a lot of planes quickly, they throw all of their safety rubrics out the window. And they tell the people that work at Boeing, don't pay attention to that. Don't pay attention to that. We need to produce planes faster. So it isn't about what he has in place. He does have everything in place in terms of procedure and policy that he needs to have in place. He just doesn't follow it. 
and this puts the public at risk. And then we saw the Alaska blowout, everybody saw that, but you guys are not looking to see that pilots are reporting dangerous conditions all the time. They are reporting challenges. They are reporting that stim stabilizer trim motors going out. If those stabilizer trim motors go out at a high altitude, those planes are gonna crash. Those are manufacturing defects. Now the FAA says we will put in place 50 supervisors, 50 inspectors into the Boeing production facility. They need to put 100 or more in order to actually see what is going on in the facility. 50 is not gonna do it. The 20 that they put in you know, several weeks ago is not gonna do it. They have to do what is necessary to secure the safety of the flying public. And they haven't done it yet after all this time, which is crazy. So that's why we're still here. We're, we're working to help prevent a third crash and get the pressure of the American public to demand aviation safety, real aviation safety, not just on paper. Thank you. This has been a bit of a lone wolf campaign for the families for the last four years. And it seems like you finally hit noise level and that people are paying attention. We have more whistleblowers coming out, a brand new one at the hearing today. Congress is clearly paying more attention. What caused the shift? The Alaska blowout on the side of the plane cannot be blamed on pilots. So before this, Boeing was always saying and the FAA was saying, oh, it's the pilots that caused this problem to happen and that problem to happen. But the side of the plane coming off is clearly a production defect. The plane was only two months old, I believe. It was a new plane. So that's what caused the attention and the scrutiny and the focus. And I am very, very sorry for those Alaska airplane passengers. But the good thing is nobody died. They were injured. They were some of them severely injured, but they didn't die. And the, the, their experience caused all of the public and the press and the Congress and the FAA to focus on what's essential, which is there are so many manufacturing defects that there can be a third crash. And there almost was. It was about as close as you can get without actually having a crash. So that made the difference. Thank you. Anybody else have a question for me? Okay. Like to step up, step up next. Have none? My name is Chris Moore, C-H-R-I-S, Moore, M-O-O-R-E, and my daughter is Danielle Moore, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E. -E. Um, my name is Clarice Moore, um, C-L-A-R-I-S-S, -S, Moore, M-O-O-R-E. Our daughter is Danielle Moore. Um, we travel here, we actually drove nine hours from Toronto to be in the hearing today to hear Cahoon. We are here today standing, even though we drove so far away, just to hear what Cajon would say for us tonight, um, today in the hearing. Because all we hear from her, coming from him, is just safety is our number one priority. That safety, that number one priority of Boeing, of their CEOs, of their management, of their engineer, is doesn't mean anything when 346 people died. We are here today and driving here. It doesn't matter how far because I all I could think is the six minutes and four seconds of my daughter on that Boeing 37 Max. Did she cry for me? Did she know that will be his last breath. Did someone hold their hands? So Cajon, Boeing, CEO, management, did you hear my daughter cry? I want them to answer and give us all the transparency. And I want them to be held accountable for murdering 346 lives. It's not only the 346 lives that they destroyed. They destroyed thousands and thousands of lives. I will never get a chance to see, hold, hug, kiss, and hear my daughter's voice 
ever again. Only maybe on my nightmares of that six minutes. So for him to say safety is number one issue, that is not even worth mean anything to me. To me, justice is for them to held accountable and be criminally charged and to face us in trial, give us our day in trial for, with them, with all of them, not only the Boeing, the management and its CEO. We're here to bear witness um, of the, the current CEO of Boeing who was present in the C-suite during the second crash. That day was a nightmare for me and it still is a night. I have to live that every night. I still wake up at 3 a.m. I still have problems. Um, a lot of issues, other medical issues I, I won't get into right now. But this man was present. He knew before the second crash that there were issues with that plane. The entire MCAS CERT plan was non-compliant. It wasn't just a rogue, uh, uh, technical pilot. It was the entire MCAS. Like, they were trying to downplay the MCAS with the FAA. In fact, they, the, the, the CERT plan that they provided to the FAA was not the, the actual MCAS that was on the plane that crashed. They also provided Transport Canada and YASA with a non-compliant MCAS certification plan. And the, their uh, their agreements are required to have the validating authority accept the what is pro provided by the manufacturer as the truth. And th so this is about truth as well. And we want to seek total transparency of what happened, especially after the first crash, but also before. And we're not getting that. We're not getting it through any channels. And the only way to do that is through uh, a criminal trial. That is the only way. And so we are here, as I said, to bear witness, to see what this uh, CEO will say. Um, they're having a lot of quality lapses. Those quality lapses were there on the plane in the plant before the first crash, when Ed Pearson testified before the uh, Congress and said that he actually quit because of the, the problems with manufacturing before the first crash. And I think at that time, there's only 200 MAX planes in the air. They could have stopped right then and there and said, yeah, we better fix this. They didn't. Now there's, what, 4,000 some MAX planes in the air? It's very difficult now to retrofit everything. But they still have issues, non-compliance issues, non-conformance issues, and even the FAA has gone along hook, line, and sinker with what they want because they have that much power, they have that much command over the aviation industry. It's a duopoly and a monopoly in the United States. That's a problem. That's a problem for, for all the flyers. Think about that too when you book your next plane. Any questions from anybody? How much influence do you think today's hearing is gonna have over DOJ's decision about whether to prosecute Boeing criminally? I hope it, they, they listen to what um, Calhoun has to say. Um, and, and also check it with the facts. The Department of Justice told us they had everything that's in the House report. And so I am at odds as, as to why they were not charged with manslaughter. Um, they, if they had the information, they could have had a more serious uh, indictment against Boeing. Uh, what they did is they actually benefited Boeing. They actually rewarded them. Uh, the amount that they had to pay was was so minuscule in comparison to what what has been lost and the damage to the industry. And look what's, what it's causing them right now. It's better to own up, fix it, get on the right track. I think a lot of people, when they see the amount they're going paid, think, oh, well, it's terrible what happened to the families, but they got very well compensated. Yes, they they actually, I think uh, the year that uh, of the crash, they uh, they brought in $100 billion. Uh, the CEO currently uh, is supposed to be leaving uh, Boeing, but being paid $33 million as, uh, I guess, a you know golden parachute. He's coming back to the board, though, from what I understand. So 
how how is how are they correcting the problem by by doing that? They're just rewarding the same old people. It's again a, a different part of the revolving door issue that is happening with the FAA consultants and with Boeing and other suppliers. And uh, it, it has to stop. There has to be more accountability. There are no professional engineers who are required to be certifying planes either. So they're just having uh, engineers or uh, graduates or um, uh, other employees to certify this. But without that professional liability, without any recourse for professional misconduct, how can you ensure the safety of the flying public? You can't. Simple. Anything else? Anybody else want to speak? Hi everyone, my name is Adnan Stumo. You heard from my mother, my sister, Samia was killed on the plane. And I'm here very simply to confront her killer. He was um, aware of all the design defects. He was one of the head decision makers to put the plane in the air, to keep the plane in the air after Lion Air crashed in late October, five months before and he is a mass killer. And I wanna look him in the face. If there's no risk of jail time for these decision makers who play with our lives, then there will be no change. We can go through FAA certifications, all of that regulation strengthening the safety of the flying public is important, but there needs to be criminal charges for the people at the top, the people in the driver's seat who are responsible for uh, for, for 346 deaths, including that of my sister in every single face that you see here. So. I want to answer Lisa's question just briefly in terms of compensation to the victims. So Boeing compensated the victims only through insurance. It didn't hurt the company at all. That compared to $30 million, more than $30 million that Calhoun is walking away with as a bonus package, and then the 60-something million dollars that Muhlenberg walked away, no single victim received anything like those compensations. So if anybody has a question about compensation and the value of human life, would you trade your child or your father or anything for several million dollars? And then do you think it's just that the people who kill our family members get, you know, over tens of millions of dollars? Is that justice? No, and it doesn't hurt Boeing at all. So they have never, never had to feel any pain at all. They just paid out through insurance. No punitive damage, no accountability. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Apora Korea. I'm just going to put this down. Thank you. My name is Zipporah Kouria, that's Z-I-P-P-O-R-A-H. I'm from London. Can you hear me? Everyone hear me? So, yeah. Hi, my name is Zipporah Kouria, that's Z-I-P-P-O-R-A-H-K-U-R-I-A. I lost my dad, Joseph Kouria Waidaka, who was 55 years old. Um, my being here is so that Calhoun can see my father's face and see the cost of his decisions. I mean, if we are here living in this nightmare that doesn't seem to end of what has now become our lives, why should the people who made decisions continue to not face the people that they let down? You know, this is literally your $30 million, the, the money that you retire, you're retiring with. This is the cost of it. This is the blood that is on your hands. Um, these are weddings that daughters will never have their fathers walk, down the, walk them down the aisle for. These are parents that will never see their children walk, um, talk, uh, go to high school, graduate, um, have jobs, have their first driving lessons. Um, and I'm just here so this can be the image. And also really here for the public to remind you guys to keep pushing, pay attention. Because in, in, in one instant, we were tweeting condolences to Lion Air victims. And in the next instance, we were the ones receiving those tweets of, we're so sorry for your loss. And it's needless. And I don't have much more to add than what the other families have already said. But to just say, we're living in a world where people, where people pay with their lives and people profit 
and government and Congress and FAA, people just continue to look aside. My question to Congress even today is, why pay attention now? Why pay attention now? Why not for the last five years that we have continually fought? We have been a muffled scream that has been screaming and no one has been paying attention. You know, I don't want to say that this hearing doesn't mean much, but I really hope that he can just face what he has done. You know, um, that, that's pretty much what I have to say. I don't know if anyone has any questions um, for me. Okay, thank you. Okay, does anybody uh, else want to speak here? And we are Zooming this. Are there any questions on Zoom? We have a number of reporters there. Catherine, please step up. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Catherine Bertet, C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, Bertet, B-E-R-T-H-E-T. -E -E I come in from Paris, and I lost my daughter, Camille, C-A-M-I-L-L-E-G-E-O-F-F-R-O-Y, Camille Geoffroy. She was 28 at the time of the crash, and she worked as a humanitarian in very dangerous countries in, the, in Africa, in refugee camps. And she dedicated, she dedicated her life, her work life, to other people and to poor people. She wanted, she wanted to do good in the world. And that day, she was en route for her, for her new work in Kenya where she would have been safer because she worked in very, very dangerous conditions. And often she had, she had taken planes that were very, very dangerous in Africa with 10 people on board or 12 people on board and in very bad conditions. So she used to tell me, okay, it's dangerous. And I used to tell her, oh, please, please call me when you arrive. And that day, she told me, okay, me, mom, when we were driving to the airport on the 9th of March, she, she, she told me, okay, mom, now you don't have to be worried or concerned when I, will, when I will fly, because I will only fly commercial planes, commercial flights. You will be safe. And the, the, the day afterwards, in the morning, I learned that, I learned that her commercial plane, her safe plane, had actually crashed and I come here I come here in the United States as often as I can when there are hearings or appointment or something like that because we owe that to all the victims here the ones we show you and the ones we don't show you those 346 people who have died because of Boeing and who would still be there would Boeing have done what they had to, to do? That is stop, that is to say, stop the 737 MAX production which is, when it was still time. Because this new, and they first made that error that uh, who, who was the cause of the DPA. They lied about the MCAS, but they had the chance to ground the plane immediately after the first crash. But they, they, they didn't do that. They decided to go on with that plane, to continue selling that, the, the, the plane that crashed in March, uh, in March 2019 was, was delivered in October. So it was a brand new plane, but they made, uh, uh, they bet that there would be no crash within two years, but the, the crash happened only four months afterwards. And I'm here because I want to see Calhoun try to explain how, how, he, made, how he made his, his safest plane in the world, because he's, this is what he's saying. Our planes are the safest and the most, most scrutinized planes in the world. Well, you, you can see, every people can see what it is. There was the, the Alaska Airlines blowout. And there, there are so many SDR, so many incidents that are reported. This is a scandal. And you can actually wonder how it can happen, because actually they had two years after the second crash. 
if, when the plane was grounding, when there was COVID, when at the period of COVID, there was no one in the air, so they had time to, to change everything. And they had actually got away, got away with murder because they had that DPA and they had three years to progress, to, to, Im to improve their, their process, to improve their, their safety their safety process and actually they did nothing and now it becomes apparent so now time has come now they have to made to be made accountable because this this cannot this cannot be denied that they didn't do anything they could have and you know we are, we already know and maybe you as journalists already know what what he will say he will say okay i i apologize for all those victims and every day i think about the victims but what does he think? He's, it's insulting to say that. We perfectly know that he doesn't think every day at all the victims. If he did that, if he would do that, then we, there wouldn't have been Alaska Airlines accident. There, there, we wouldn't be there. That's why I'm here. Are there any questions for Catherine here? I have a question for any of the family members. What do you do if DOJ decides not to prosecute criminally? Appeal. If he decides not to prosecute, it is your question. Yeah. Yes, we go and see. Yes, well, the first judge may not be agree, may not agree with the DOJ first. That would be an, our our hope. But then we appeal immediately. So you're all prepared to keep hiring. Yes. Are, yeah. we, we will not give up. We we'll will not give up. appeal directly to the judge, yeah. directly to Reed O'Connor, who was tasked by the appellate court to look out for the public interest. They said, Judge Reed O'Connor can, can look out for the public interest without uh, listening to what DOJ wants. The, the case has already been filed. Charges have already been filed against the defendant, Boeing. Judge Reed O'Connor can take this into his own hands, and that's what we'll appeal to him to do. And Judge O'Connor was also the one who said that uh, this DPA and, and those deaths, the, the loved ones who died, uh, that was the deadliest corporate crime in the American history. So we are confident that there will be prosecution. The DOJ has, has the opportunity, the unique opportunity for five years now to do the right thing. And let's make it clear as well, like the ET302 families, this isn't just a fight about us, it's a fight for the public, for the safety of the public. We will not relent, we will not stop. It's been five years, we're still here, and we'll keep going for as long as we need to. And I just hope that the public, if they fail us, that you guys don't fail yourselves, that you join us in this fight. Don't just share another repost. Actually write to your representatives. A lot of us don't even have jurisdiction in, in the US. We don't have much of a say so, but we will keep showing up, not just for our loved ones, but for you guys as well. And I think that that's the, the one thing. Regardless of what this outcome is, we have been dealt more blows than most have ever had to. We have had to fight the DOJ. We've had to fight, you know, Boeing. And it doesn't end now. Like, look at the people that are standing here year in year out whether it's 10 years 50 years we'll be here fighting still and if you look at the character of the people involved david calhoun makes money off, off of bombs that kill innocent people and so and now israel has just bailed them out and bought a lot of 737 max planes and so if you look at that just look at that reality Okay, so there are people in tents and they get burned up by Boeing bombs. Is David Calhoun upset about that? Does that give him nightmares? Does it give him nightmares that his bombs kill little kids, 40 little kids at a time? Does that make him upset? This is the person who's saying that he cares about safety. This is the person that he says he cares about our loved ones. The person who makes a, a maximum amount of money off of the death of our loved ones and also the death of other innocent people. Yes, yes, I would add something because uh, you were talking about, uh, yes, this is an international problem. This is not only an American problem. Boeing is the biggest company in the United States. But like you see, uh, in the ET-302 crash, there were many, many nationalities from everywhere in the world. And Boeing 737 MAX and all Boeing airplanes are flying all over the world. And so this is an international problem. This is a national, international issue. And 
all the pub, all the flying public in around the world they have to be aware when when your children when you yourself you you have to fly because you you want to go to, to fly from a point a to a point b in the world you don't have to be afraid of taking planes you have to you have to fly safely as as personally i have a my nephew is currently for one year in australia and why i know that in france there are no 737 max a or nine or anything. I know that in Australia there are so many and I'm so afraid for him. And so, but I can't be afraid for the totality of the people in the world because I don't know them. I would just want them to fly safely. And this is a question, this happens in the United States, but they act for the, the international world, for all the country. And this is for all those people that we act and that we are here. the uh, Blumenthal Center, Blumenthal hearing. So thank you very much everybody for coming and uh, we will hopefully see you then later in the day. Good afternoon, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 